Hello everyone, this is Dave. It's time for another tutorial. Today it's one of my favorite things, markers. So the markers we have today are called alcohol markers because they have alcohol in them as the, uh, the body of it instead of water or something like that. The markers that we had when I was younger called design markers. Um, I think they used a material called Bestine, which was really toxic and affected you in some pretty bad ways, including possible sterility. So avoid those old markers. Now, I have an agenda for today's tutorial. As you can see, we've got uh, no Sharpies. Sharpies are great if you want to write, you know, just random stuff and you're going to throw away whatever you're doing, but they are just so bad for your paper. I told you that they bleed through and I found a really good example of them. Let me excavate it here. All right, this is a Canson sketch pad that I got that has a bunch of different kinds of paper. And at some point, I went through here and I drew with the Sharpie. Yeah, it's right here. So, I put this mark on here. This is a Sharpie, and this has been in here for a few years. And you can see it has kind of like a purple haze around the edge, but that's not just the bad part. The bad part is, here's the page on top of it. So if you had drawings stacked, that would have been on there. And now for the really bad part, is it bled through, okay? It bled through, then it stained the page underneath of it. Heck, <laughs> keeps going. Then it stained the page underneath that. And I don't know if you can see it, but it even stained the page under that just a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's about as far as it went. So it basically ruined this page, this page. The page it was on is now not so great and the page ahead of it. So the main drawing page and three other pages. If you had drawings stacked, you would have been in a lot of trouble because those would have been totally destroyed. Not, you know, it doesn't look bad, but nobody's gonna wanna buy it, is my point. It, it just, it can take money out of your pocket. All right, so that was the first one. I've said it before, Sharpies, chuck them, right? Don't use them, just use one of these instead. Let's talk about types of markers because you've got your, your sort of super desirable Copic markers, the Japanese markers, which started this sort of art marker trend. There were lots of others before this, but Copic invented the uh, brush tip, which is really fantastic. But now they're so emulated, you can buy markers that are just as good for a super affordable price. And what I use are these Ohuhu markers because they're literally a fraction of the cost. You can just buy a set off of Amazon or eBay or wherever, and you're gonna be good to go. So we have all these types, and the one thing that Copic does offer are these wide markers that you can't really find anyplace else. These are fantastic. I keep three Copic wides in my sketch kit. I keep the black and then a warm gray and a light gray at the 30%. And the really good thing about Copics is refills are readily available. I use another brand called Touch by Shin Han that are really good. And I have, this is one of their containers, I have refills in here. So this is a Copic refill, it's just full of ink. And this was one of the, the Shin Han. The cool thing is, these are all alcohol marker ink, so you can refill any marker with these, as long as, you know, it's basically the same color. So if I had this red Ohuhu, and it was kind of the same color, then I could just fill it with this Copic and not worry about it. And these refills are really in, inexpensive compared to the actual marker barrels themselves. So consider having refills. I refilled that black and those grays all the time. And it's literally as simple as just pulling this out. If I have a paper towel here, I'll show you. See, you can pull that out and then you put the ink down inside of there. It dribbles out, it's a, it has like a little spout. And you fill that back up and then just pop it back in. Let it sort of soak through and you are good to go. This one's loaded with ink right now. I, think, I don't think I've used it since I refilled it. But those are really awesome, so keep that in mind. You can get those off of uh, Dick Blick Art Supplies, and they're so much cheaper than if you bought them in a store. All right, so types, we covered that. I use anything and everything I can get, but uh, Ohuhu will seem to work really well. And I watch uh, that guy we talked about, Jazza, who has his YouTube channel. He did a gigantic, multi-video review of every single kind of marker he could find. And he thought the Ohuhus were just as good as the Copics. So 
Don't take my word for it. You can take his. Right, so next thing is once you get your markers, you want to know what they look like because markers are kind of like gouache paint where they look like one thing when they're wet and they look like a different thing when they're dry. Sometimes when I'm sketching, I just do this. I just randomly pick out my color palettes. So like I'll go through and I'll say, okay, I need color palette to do this green part. And I'll just pick the three colors that I want because I want a, a main color, a highlight color, and a shadow co color. And then I'll go through and I'll mark them down to make sure what they look like. I'll let them dry. But the alternative to that, and probably smarter because you won't be wasting your time on markers, is to make yourself a color chart. And I've made one for these Ohuhus. I made them as soon as I bought, I bought the uh, color set. And you can see I've labeled them all. And they looked pretty different, some of them did, from what they were when they were wet or from what the cap, the cap color. So this one's G1, which is that. You can see it's a little darker than the cap color. So that's it. Here's uh, Y2. It's close, but again, it's a little darker. So having this color chart will help you uh, figure out what you want to use to do your piece. And I mentioned primary color, shadow color, and stuff. Uh, I've got a blank page in here someplace. I'll show you how that works. Got all these monster drawings from a job. Um, generally, when I'm working, I pick these three colors. And I have started out with... Um, my lines. I've got a Micron PN. You can see it has a slightly different nib than some of the others. But, you know, I started off with this. Sometimes I've done some shading in there. This is going to be like a sphere, right? We'll indicate a light source. Real basic here. And I'll start by putting down my highlight color. And here's where the brush tip is so great because I can kind of feather it. But um, I start with my highlight color and I don't have to color in this whole sphere. I can just color in the part that I need that. And also, it's really important when you're using markers like paint to plan your light source ahead of time and your color scheme. So my light's gonna be coming from this direction here. And I'm not gonna put pigment down where my highlight is. So I'm gonna kind of feather it and leave a bit of a highlight and I think there's going to be some reflected color down here so I'll put some back there and while that's still pretty wet so the colors will blend together I'm going to go ahead and apply this and do some again hatching or feathering whatever you want to call it kind of keeps your strokes consistent and since it's wet, it'll even out a little bit. This is where color theory comes in pretty well, too. I would also have used yellow as my highlight color for a red palette. And then we'll add a little bit of the shadow color. And then that's basically what I would have done for that. And they're sort of, you know, like in here they're blending together because it was a little wetter. But uh, it worked out pretty well. So that's how I kind of keep things going. And I also could have put a shadow color in. I've got to pick like one of these lavender colors. Kind of put that into the shadow. Maybe you'll be able to see it, maybe you won't. But instead of using a gray, using another color will help, help add some sophistication and some body to it. And this render paper doesn't bleed through, so it's nice. But uh, that sort of segues into one of the other things I had on my list, which was styles. So there's sort of three basic ways you can work with these. Just looking through my markers. I've got what's called a blending marker. These things do not work like you think they do. I had somebody explain it to me once at the official Copic booth at New York Comic Con, and she said to think of it more as it lifts up the color, 
but I don't know. It still doesn't work for me the way I think it should. Let's use these two since these are similar. You kind of put them down so you can see what they look like individually. Similar color family, but obviously way more saturated and uh, darker value for those two. Let's see what this what this blending marker does to that while they're still kind of wet. They haven't fully dried. All right, so I'm really loading that up. And it just doesn't, it doesn't blend. It's getting on the tip, so it's transferring. So it doesn't work the way you think it's going to, but here you can see it transferred out. Now, what if I get this really wet with that first, and then I put this in here. Oops, on the other end. I kind of go lightly across. I go real fast. And what if I, wow, it's still all really wet. Then I kind of go back in here. No, it didn't really do it. It's getting a little bit of transfer. That dark color doesn't work so well. So I don't know, I just really don't like those blending markers. If you know how to use blending markers and you're like, oh, I can get really awesome effects with that, let me know how to do it. All right, but back to the three styles. I've got written down here, you have modulated, which is sort of like anime cell shaded style. You have feathered, which is kind of what this was here and around that rim. And then you have smooth blended, which is kind of like wet on wet. So you have these three techniques. And uh, you know, I could have filled in that sphere by going like this. I'm automatically getting some blending in between the two because they're so wet when I'm putting them down. Yeah, see how that green is just, because it's really wet, it's just blending right in nice and smooth. What happens if we take that blending marker here? Just pulled the green into my highlight. Cleaning off my tip. That's what I'm doing when I'm rubbing this like that. I'm trying to get the pigment off of it. So I got natural fading. So that's sort of the wet on wet. And if you really want to get good modulating or feathering, I think it's probably best to do a color and then let it dry. And the reason, the way I'm getting that feathering color is I'm pressing hard and then lighten, lighter as I go out. And it gives it that tone. And I can do it really light here. I can do it with uh, this end too. Sort of place to the natural texture of the nib. The nib is the tip here where it, you can, you can see the texture of the paper, and the more textured your paper is, the more obvious and distinct that would be. So you could use different kinds of paper to get different effects. So you would let this dry, and this uh, this render paper, R-E-N-D-R, -E it has like a coating in between the pages, so markers actually tend to stay wet a little longer, which is good, I think, because it blends just enough to give you a nicer kind of soft look. Right, so then once that's dry, you can go through and do this and it won't, won't blend together. And you should note, you can see the colors through there. You can always overlay colors on top of one another. I see people just using colors like to fill one full area, but I think they look better if you kind of blend them together sometimes or overlay them. So now instead of that blending together like it did there, it's staying nice and distinct because I took a second to let it dry. So the way you work controls the final effect of how it looks. But feathering is cool. I have some pieces I'll show you. I think they're in this other sketchbook over here. And please keep in mind that I am left-handed, so I work on the opposite side of the page as most people because I don't like this ring under my hand. So I've got... Like this is just the basic value study of some characters. But here's one where I've used a limited palette 
and I've done some hatching with the Copic Wide in the background. Um, wherever that black one went, here it is. So this is this, and all the rest of these are just regular markers. The black is a brush pen, which I have right here. And it's really important to let this dry all the way before you go over it with marker or else it'll smear everywhere. But there's one. Here's a good one where I used the uh, sort of hatching and brush control. This was left white and then I blended it together and I did the same here. I controlled it really light and I just used subtle color overlays. I used the wet on wet to get that kind of nice soft effect inside the windshield. And the center part, the center white, that's the paper I left, but then there's this line here. And that was done with one of these. I've got the jelly uh, whiteout pen. I've got this big old Presto whiteout, and then I've got a white pencil. And depending on the surface and the markers you're using and stuff, you can use these to add extra highlights. And for my work, that sort of makes it all come together. This was my March of Robots, so I've just got tons of robot drawings in here. Uh, here's one where I went really dark with it. This one in here I think is good for the background. Here we go. So this one was cool because I put the black down in the background and I mentioned layering before. So I, then I used another Copic wide but a red one and I covered the entire background, even the black. So it adds like a richness to the color. So it's not just black on white, it has that extra red that kind of shows through. And that sort of layering works really well. And then I also overlaid some subtle pinks into the shadows here. You can see, just to add a little extra dimension to the piece, that's like reflected light that comes in and fills the shadow. So it sort of brings the piece all together and makes it feel cohesive. Like it's all one, you know, one working part. Um, here's some, some really good examples of the hatching. Or I probably, looks like I did the, the red with a little orange under it. And then when that was dry, I went back over it and feathered because I didn't have a lot of reds. So the feathering was the only way for me to get any sort of modulation in the color. And then to keep that feel consistent, I did the background that way too and kept it nice and neat. And um, yeah, it looks like I was pretty good about keeping away from the edges to get this effect, but in the end I had to go back over it with this marker to get that outline to sort of to add a bit of style to it. And here was another one done pretty much the same way. You can see all the shading and stuff going on in there with a little cast light from the eyes. All right, so let's talk about paper. Uh, we talked about paper with watercolors and how important that is. So we've got basic copy paper. And I actually really like to do markers on basic copy paper. I think it works great. But we have some other alternatives. We've got that render paper I was just working on. This is just a different pad on it of stuff. And then this is a, a really fun one. This is toned paper. And uh, this is from Strathmore. They make it in sort of this like coolish, or yeah, this is more of the coolish color. They also have one that's brownish or beige-ish, and uh, it's just really fun for, for establishing a tone. Like when you're working on a painting, sometimes you'll put down a mid-tone, you'll do a wash across your painting, and then push back your darks and pull out your lights. That's what this paper allows you to do with marker. And that's also where these come in handy because all of these highlights were done with this pen or one like it. Now well, let's see, it works pretty well with color got a few robotic, robotic insects here I did for a project. And um, then this one was really cool. I played in with the blacks and then I just put one tone, well, two tones over it and pulled out the highlights and it gives it a nice dimension. So this kind of paper is awesome. If you've never tried it, give it a shot. And then the last thing is um, tracing paper. Sometimes it's called vellum, but sometimes vellum is not this. So you can see, you can see through it. It has a nice crispness to this. It's kind of almost like a thick rice paper kind of feel. This has totally different properties than everything else because it's such a tight surface that the markers don't sink down into it. And you can actually do some interesting things with it, which I will give you a demonstration of. Okay, and this will bring us into another part of our, our piece, which is mixed media. 
Markers work together with a lot of other things, so you're not just stuck using markers with markers. You could use them with watercolor. I don't do it too much, but um, one of the things that's fun to use with, and I learned from industrial design stuff, is you can mix it with Conte or, uh, this is Conte, I'm sorry, Conte or pastels. And what some people do is they'll actually grind this down into a powder and they'll either smear it on their page to create effect, they'll mix it with baby powder as a medium and smear that around. They can use cotton balls or whatever. But I'm gonna give you a quick demonstration of how, how this can work. Because if you ever see a marker drawing and it has a super smooth background, like a sky or something, you're like, how did they do that? Chances are pretty good. They did not use a marker to do that. They're using mixed media. So I've got a chunk of paper towel here, which we used for our black marker. I'll kind of lay some of that down. Take my paper towel and blend that out. And this is what they do. They'll blend this out and get that nice soft effect and then they'll draw their markers on top of it. Usually it's like cars or something, right? So you've got your, your super corny car. The spoiler on the back and stuff. And the intake, right? So you've got this car and they'll have this effect and then they'll go back in and put some other colors on top of it and uh, it works great. It works really, really well. And the cool thing about this too is then you can go back in and if you want like a highlight on here, you can just erase it. Right? You could add in whatever you want. Now, <laughs> this is one of the caveats of this paper is that, do you see it streaked? Normally that ink would have already dried, but it did not dry very fast, so that's why I didn't use my hand. Because it would have smeared all over the place and it would have been a mess. But let me show you with some markers what you can do on here. Everything comes out lighter, too. So you can actually do some cool stuff where you can have multi-plane kind of effects. For example, on this page I would have, well, let's use this light green. I would do one drawing that was registered with the other, right? But have that, and then I could work on top of that with this, and you can, since you can see through, it gives you a nice dimension to it, and you can just register these two pieces, tape them together, whatever, mount them together, and you can get this really cool multi-level effect. But, what I wanted to show you is, so this is dry, this is completely dry. What happens when I go over it with another marker? Can you see how that sort of like worked back into it? Because this doesn't let stuff soak in, it stays on top. Now, I can actually go so far as to pick up the color like that. So this paper, you think, oh, it's kind of a mess but it has its advantages. Now, I've got something else over here for you that you may never have thought of, but you're working with alcohol markers, right? So watercolors are soluble with water. Alcohol markers are not soluble with water, but they are with alcohol, and this is rubbing alcohol. This is like 90% isopropyl alcohol. Just uh, very similar to the stuff you might have in like fingernail polish, but you can buy it in bottles. I use it for 3D printing cleanup. So now, I can actually go back in with this and work with it. Whether I'm smearing it out and making a nice smooth background, kind of like we did with the pastel, or if I'm just trying to clean up something, this adds something extra. You can see it picked it right up. I can come over here and it's, it's transferring a little bit. So what happens, I've got this on here. Let's put some wet marker in there. Yeah, check that out. Now you're getting these trippy effects. You could, could do all kinds of crazy stuff. You could put this in a spray bottle and spritz it on stuff and you would get some cool effects. But you would never be able to get this kind of effect if you were using normal paper. So there's some benefits to this. But let's try 
what that alcohol looks like. Oh, and here's another idea. You can do a transfer, I bet. Got that green side. Let's put that down on there. Yeah, look at that. That's a great texture. So you could control where that went, and it totally changed the way that looks, too. So you can really change the textures you can get with marker, depending on the substrate and the different ways you use the media. I actually really like working on this vellum stuff. Uh, let's try again. So I've still got some ink here. Yeah, so the alcohol doesn't work so much on regular paper. It's picking up a little bit of it. So maybe I could lighten that. Yeah, I'm lightening it a little bit. So I can still get an effect. Yeah, it's totally soaked through. Oh, it did make it actually go through the one piece of paper and transfer onto the other. That was unexpected. And right onto my desk. So that's interesting. I never really thought about transferring color between pages like that. You could probably get some cool effects going on. That's just rubbing alcohol. Easy, well, I know it's not so easy to get with the pandemic right now because you use it for your um, hand sanitizers and stuff, but usually it's, it's easy to get. So let's look at our list here. We've got uh, no Sharpies, right? No Sharpies, get the types, got your color chart, which is really important. You got your paper, mixed media, the alcohol and the styles, the feather, the wet, and the modulated. I think you just have to experiment like anything. You have to get used to it, play around with it, see what happens. But all in all, you can do some fun stuff. And it's another technique, like with these, is all of my drawings, you noticed this was on top of the marker, but you can actually put this on top of the marker and then once it dries, you can go back over it with the marker again to kind of tint it. It'll never get as dark as the original color, but it allows you to have some different kind of textures going on. And especially this one, well, if you work into it, it'll kind of smush out so you can kind of spread it around a little bit with the marker. You just have to be sure that you clean off your tip, but it's pretty cool. All right, so I tried to keep this one nice and short. I uh, hope you got something out of it. And uh, then maybe at some point you guys can show me some awesome marker drawings that you made.